the clerk. Government business, notice number one, motion offering an apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples. Prime Minister. Today we honour the Indigenous peoples of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations. This blemished chapter in our national history. Some have asked why apologise. Let me begin to answer by telling the parliament just a little of one person's story. An elegant, eloquent and wonderful woman in her 80s, full of life, full of funny stories, despite what has happened in her life's journey. A woman who has travelled a long way to be with us today. A member of the Stolen Generation who shared some of her story with me when I called round to see her just a few days ago. Nana Nungalo Fijo, as she prefers to be called, was born in the late 1920s. She remembers her earliest childhood days, living with her family and her community in a bush camp just outside Tennant Creek. She remembers the love and the warmth and the kinship of those days long ago, including traditional dancing around the campfire at night. She loved the dancing. She remembers once getting into strife when, as a four-year-old girl, she insisted on dancing with the male tribal elders, rather than just sitting and watching the men as the girls were supposed to do. But then, sometime around 1932, when she was about four, she remembers the coming of the welfare men. Her family had feared that day and had dug holes in the creek bank where the children could run and hide. What they hadn't expected was that the white welfare men didn't come alone. They brought a truck, they brought two white men and an Aboriginal stockman on horseback, cracking his stock whip. The kids were found. They ran for their mothers, screaming, but they couldn't get away. They were herded and piled onto the back of the truck. Tears flowing. Her mum tried clinging to the sides of the truck as her children were taken away to the bungalow in Alice, all in the name of protection. A few years later, government policy changed. Now the children would be handed over to the missions to be cared for by the churches. But which church would care for them? The kids were simply told to line up in three lines. Nana Fijo and her sisters stood in the middle line, her older brother and cousin on her left. Those on the left were told that they had become Catholics, those in the middle, Methodists, and those on the right, Church of England. That's how the complex questions of post-Reformation theology were resolved in the Australian outback in the 1930s. It was as crude as that. She and her sister were sent to a Methodist mission on Goulburn Island and then Croker Island. Her Catholic brother was sent to work at a cattle station and her cousin to a Catholic mission. Nana Fijo's family had been broken up for a second time. She stayed at the mission until after the war, when she was allowed to leave for a pre-arranged job as a domestic in Darwin. She was 16. Nana Fijo never saw her mum again. After she left the mission, her brother let her know that her mum had died years before, a broken woman fretting for the children that had literally been ripped away from her. I asked Nana Fijo what she would have me say today about her story. She thought for a few moments, then said that what I should say today was that all mothers are important. And she added, families, keeping them together is very important. It's a good thing that you are surrounded by love and that love is passed down the generations. That's what gives you happiness. These stories cry out to be heard. They cry out for an apology. Instead, from the nation's parliament, there has been a stony and stubborn and we, deafening the silence. We, the the nation, are ultimately responsible. Not those who gave effect to our laws. The problem lay with the laws themselves. As has been said of settler societies elsewhere, we are the bearers of many blessings from our ancestors. And therefore, we must also be the bearer of their burdens as well. To the stolen generations, I say the following. As Prime Minister of Australia, I am sorry. 
On behalf of the Government of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Parliament of Australia, I am sorry. And I offer you this apology without qualification. We apologise for the hurt, the pain and suffering we, the Parliament, have caused you by the laws that previous parliaments have enacted. We apologise for the indignity, the degradation and the humiliation these laws embodied. We offer this apology to the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the families and the communities whose lives were ripped apart by the actions of successive governments under successive parliaments. In making this apology, I would also like to speak personally to the members of the Stolen Generation and their families. I know that in offering this apology on behalf of the government and the parliament, there is nothing I can say today that can take away the pain you have suffered personally. Whatever words I speak today, I cannot undo that. Words alone are not that powerful. Grief is a very personal thing. So let thing. us turn this page together. Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, government and opposition, Commonwealth and state, and write this new chapter in our nation's story together. Mr Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. <laughs>